Good morning, Life Spring. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, this may not be a surprise to anybody in the house, but I was spanked as a child. I don't know where you come down on spanking. If you're one of those that are opposed, trust me, if you had raised me, you probably have another view. So I was spanked, and I wasn't spanked every day by any means. I'm sure they could find something every day if they really looked. But I think I only remember actually being spanked maybe eight or ten times. But one day I remember very clearly we were at the county fair, and our parents set us free. They said, hey, go, go run amok. Go, go, go with your friends and, and go enjoy the fair. And so we did. And he said, this is the only rule. Be back here at 6. So we ran and we did the fair thing. And I was having so much fun. When 6 o'clock went and, and came, I didn't want to go back. And I didn't. I didn't go back. And I just continued to have fun with my friends. And then the announcements on the PA system started to take place. Looking for Michael Green. I heard those. I still didn't go back. Finally, I don't know how much later it was. It was a good time later. I finally went back to our meeting spot, and there was this relief on my parents' faces. I could see it. They were, they were actually glad to see me, which is good to see. And, but there was underneath this tone of frustration and anger. I could, I could tell by just looking at my dad that he was on simmer, that he was angry. Now, he was civil, and he was polite. He, he didn't raise his voice or anything, but I knew I knew I had a problem. I knew there were going to be consequences for this, and I was going to have to wait, which is the worst thing, to wait, to, to actually have to just ride in the car. You have to get to the car. You have to ride in the car. You got to get home. Everybody settled in and then meet with dad. And I hated that, that tension of knowing, knowing it's coming <laughs> and, and just kind of wishing, hurry up, get it over with, right? But I hated that. That's kind of where we are in our Bible story today. The, the Hebrews are in this tension with God. We're in the story of this golden calf, and they have really messed up. They've messed up big time. They've made this calf to worship as another God in replace of their God. And they broke their covenant. Remember, the second commandment is make no graven images. And that's what they've done. They've made this idol, and they're worshiping it. And they're... They're backstabbing God. I mean, it, they, they had this covenant they formed just about 40 days earlier, and they are betraying God. They're violating the covenant, and, and it's like adultery. And so God is furious. And we saw that last week. God is just so furious. And he threatens to kill all of them, to wipe them out. And he's justified doing it. Because, because of the rules. They, they said they'd abide by. They weren't abiding by. And he's threatening to just wipe them all out. And Moses has his finest hour. Moses steps up. He's a great guy. Moses steps up like the leader he needs to be. And he comes between the people and God and, and intercedes and begs God to change his mind, to, to, to let go of his fierce anger and change his mind. And God listens. Incredibly, God listens and God changes his mind and he decides not to wipe them out, at least not right then and there. So, so today we're going to pick it up where Moses now has to deal with the sin that's in the camp. Moses is the one that's got to go down and confront them and get this what's, this, what's going on. He's got to get it to stop. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to pick it up from verse 15. And <laughs> this is, this is Moses' reaction to what's going on in the camp. So Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. So that must have been pretty cool, actually, to have these stone tablets. They're, they're written on both sides. That's interesting. Both sides are written, and it's written with the hand of God, and it's the Ten Commandments, the moral law, the moral code that God wants them to live by. Number two was, hey, make no graven images. But number one was, have no other gods before me. I mean, they're breaking that one too. So he has these stone tablets that God has written himself, which must have been incredible to behold. And he's coming down the hill and he gets down a little bit of the way and he picks up Joshua on the way. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is sound of war in the camp. So remember, there's about 2 million people down there at the foot of the mountain in this camp with all of their tents. And they're in the 
middle of a festival worshiping this new god or gods. And, and they're having a Woodstock kind of experience based on what we can tell from, from what we read in the New Testament. There is some orgy kind of experiences here. There's, there's free love and there's dancing and there's drunkenness. It's just, it is a festival to these new gods. And they're hearing this uproar, this commotion coming up the mountain. And Joshua's concerned it's war, but Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory and it's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. So they're having this, this celebration, this worship service for, for this, this new God or gods. And when Moses approached the camp, he actually gets down to the bottom of the hill and he sees what they're doing and he sees them worshiping this golden calf in violation of, of, of the law. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. So he takes those tablets, those incredible tablets that God wrote with his own finger in his hand, and, and he takes them and he realizes they've broken these. They've broken these. One of the ways, one of the images we get is that, that the law is like a big plate glass window. Because James says, if you break the law just at one spot, you break the whole law. Think about that. You break it at one spot, it's broken. It doesn't matter where you break it. You break it here, it's still broken. But they took like a sledgehammer to this and broke it at multiple spots. They had more gods, right? They had a God ahead of their God. And then they built graven images and it looks like they're doing the adultery thing. And then on top of it, they're giving credit for rescue. They're rescue out of Egypt to another God. So they're breaking number three. They're... they're they're messing up in big ways. And Moses realizes, hey, this is broken already. It's only been 40 some days and this covenant is broken. And so he takes those tablets and he throws them down to the ground in this public display and just shatters them at the foot of the mountain saying, this is what you've done. It's this picture, this picture of what's going on. So he, he breaks them. So Moses approached the camp. He saw the calf and the dancing and his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Wow. So he's, Moses is hot now too. Before it was God was hot. Now Moses is hot. And so he breaks the tablets and then he does this next thing. Then he took the calf, this golden calf, this idol that they made the people had made and burned it in the fire. So I believe he broke it up and then threw it in the fire. And then he ground it up into powder. So took all the ash and everything at the base of the fire. He ground it up into powder and scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Wow. What's going on there? Well, Moses is hot, right? He's angry. But what is he trying to say? He takes that idol breaks it up throws it in fire and then puts it in the water the powder into the fire and says hey drink this i think that's his disdain i think that's that's his contempt he has for this idol because what's going to happen to that idol this too shall pass right he's thinking excrement feces it will pass this is the contempt he has for their idol kind of gross but moses is making a point so he's made two big public points already. He's thrown down the tablets. He's now destroyed the idol and made them drink it. And he's going to continue. Now, then he's going to publicly rebuke Aaron because Aaron has really blown it here. He was the man in charge in Moses' absence. So he said to Aaron, he said, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? What's going on here, Aaron? I put you in charge. Why, why didn't you just tell them No. What, how did they convince you? What kind of leverage did they have on you to get you to do this horrible sin? And this is amazing where, where Aaron shows, this is a huge contrast between Moses, the great guy, and, and Aaron, the terrible leader. And, and Aaron it just shows himself again to be such a terrible leader. He says, he says, do not be angry, my Lord. Aaron answered, you know how prone these people are to evil. Now, I don't know why I picture Aaron this way, but I picture Aaron like a, a, a cool surfer. I don't know why, but I picture him like one of these surfer dudes out in California, and he's kind of half high on cough syrup. And so, so I, I'm serious. I, 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 so I picture him like with Moses, chill out, dude, relax. <laughs> What's the deal? Why, why are you all excited about this, Moses? What's the deal? Do not be angry. Just relax. 
It's all right. And so Aaron doesn't even get, Aaron doesn't even get the reason why Moses is angry. The reason for anger. And he's like, just chill, dude. And then he doesn't own any of his own responsibility for it. He says, he says you know how prone these people are to evil. Well, Aaron's the big problem here. He's the one that made the idol. When the people came to him, he was the one that, that, that guided them through the steps. Notice verse 23. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. And as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out popped a calf. Out came this calf. It was this incredible miracle. Now, we know that's not true because we saw just briefly ago last week that Aaron put a lot of work into this golden calf. He made a cast, right? He made this cast for the molten gold to be poured in and it was shaped like this, the calf. And then after it was done and he broke the cast off of it and when the gold was hardened, he, he chiseled and etched it and tooled it to make it look more magnificent. It was a work of art. It wasn't just he threw it in the fire and out popped out a calf. And so Aaron's like, hey, I don't know. I don't know, dude. Uh, just chill out. It's not a big deal. You know how bad these people are. And, 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 and Aaron's the one. Aaron's the one that's driving the boat. He's the one that suggested they have the festival. <sighs> this is just terrible that Aaron won't own up. But we get the point. Moses is broken the tablets he's ground up the idol and made them drink it he's publicly confronted Aaron and guess what's going on despite all of this commotion where it's like it's like dad coming home and their son is thrown a keg party and he doesn't think his dad will be home till tomorrow and he's got this big party with all of his friends from school and dad shows up early that's what's happened here, right? Moses has shown up and just the whole party's ruined and everybody's kind of the, the smart ones are just laying low and getting out of there. But the dumb ones continue to party and that's what's going on here. There's still some that even though he's thrown down the tablets and broke them, even though he's made them drink the aisle, even though he's publicly rebuked Aaron, there are some that's still doing their thing, worshiping this other God. So Moses saw that the people were running wild. They're still running amok. And that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become the laughingstock of their enemies. Why would they become the laughingstock? Because this was the God who rescued them. He's the guy that, this is the God that did all these miracles to get them out of Egypt, miraculously save them. And they're going to betray him in just a matter of days and turn to another God? It's foolishness. And so he stood at the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. So Moses is still watching the people. They're, they're clueless. They're, they, they haven't sobered up or realized, hey, dad's back. And they haven't stopped partying. And some of them are still doing their Woodstock thing. And they're doing practicing free love and drunkenness and just all of this stuff, worshiping this idol who's now been destroyed and drunk. But, but they're still doing the revelry thing. And so Moses says, okay, choose. Choose. Those who want to be with Yahweh, come over here. Whoever is for the Lord, come over here. Come to me. And the ones that respond are the Levites. All of the Levites rallied to him. So the, who are the Levites? So the, there are 12 tribes of Israel because Jacob had 12 sons. One of them was named Levi. And so all of his descendants are called Levites. And interestingly, Moses and Aaron are both Levites. So this includes Aaron. So maybe he's starting to wise up. But they rallied to him. They said, hey, we've messed up. This is, this is like repentance. This is, a, this is a public display of repentance where, yeah, we messed up. We, 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 we went after this other God and we made this idol and we worshiped it and it was wrong. It was a huge mistake. And we don't want to do that anymore. And so they turn their back. That's what repentance means to change your mind. So they change their mind about this idol. And then it usually means an about face, usually includes a 180 degree turn because you've changed your mind. And they, they turn and they, they go to where Moses is and the Levites practice repentance and they show up. 
And this is where we get to the hard part of the story where people tend to struggle. Verse 27, then he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. So this is a command from God. Each man, each of you Levites, right? Each man strap on a sword, go to your tent, get your sword and go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. Now that's a serious command. What is he really saying? He's saying this. He's saying, basically, there are people that won't stop. They're in absolute defiance of God. I've thrown down the tablets and broke them. I've, 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 I've destroyed this idol and made everybody drink it. I've publicly rebuked Aaron. And, and, and most people have, have wised up and realized, okay, the party's over. But there's people out there that are refusing for the party to be over. They're, they're defying God and they're living in rebellion of God and they're breaking the covenant still, even after being called out on it, they're still doing it. And so take your swords and whoever refuses to obey God, who, those who want to defy him, run them through, kill them. And that's what they do. So the Levites did as Moses commanded and that day, about 3,000 people died. Now, think about that. That seems like a big number, doesn't it? Well, out of 2 million, percentage-wise, that's good news. It could be way worse. It's like 0.02%, 0.015%. It's, it's, it's a small percentage of the population. But still, it's 3,000 people. They die. And the Levites, the Levites obey God. Now, imagine how difficult that was for the Levites to basically be put in this place where you've got to choose between God and the world, the culture, what the people want. And, 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 and I'm asking you to obey me to be for God in opposition to culture. This is where we find ourselves every day as Christians, is it not? Every day, God asks us to live for him, to live differently, to live for Christ, and to be different than the world, to, to be in the world, but not of the world. And so that's hard to do, is it not? To say, hey, I, I'm going to live like God wants me to live. I, I, the culture's wrong on this, and I'm going to call him out on this. This is wrong. Isn't that hard? To have the courage to say, hey, I'm going to be a force here against the culture. I'm going to swim against the current. I'm going to swim against the tide. I'm going to swim against all the other fish coming the other direction and say, hey, this is wrong. And the Levites are willing to do that. And they're willing to do that even if it becomes to a father or a brother or a friend is what it tells us. The Levites did this. And notice verse 29. After they did that, Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. God honored their willingness to oppose their culture. Now, let's talk about this, God's wrath, because this makes people really uncomfortable. But, but let me say this, if you really think about it, we all want a God who has some wrath in him. Do we not? Now, you may say instinctively, no, 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 no. We Think about it. What do you want to happen to Hitler? What do you want to happen to Hitler? Do you think, you think, you think Hitler should just waltz into heaven and, and have this wonderful external life experience? I think every one of us wants justice. We want a God of justice who's willing to punish wrong. In fact, most people, if they, the, the Hitler's name is brought up, there's like, oh, I hope there's a special spot in hell for him especially horrible spot in hell for him is the typical attitude. We, we want God to punish. We want God to bring justice. We just get uncomfortable when he actually does it. For instance, we would want justice against human traffickers, people's serial child abusers, serial killers. We would want to see God intervene and there be consequences for these people. And I think we get squirmish, we get, we, we get squeamish when, when, uh, when, when we actually see it though. 
or, or when it's being punished for something maybe we don't agree with. And we're hoping here in this case that it's not. And it's not. There's the death penalty. Remember, they, they made a covenant. And their lives were on the line and they refused. They defied God and he was well within his rights to, to bring capital punishment on them. It's a hard, hard lesson, but it is, it's one we all want to see in the end. We all want there to be justice. We all want a God who will punish when he needs to punish. And so the Levites are set aside this day. They're set apart. That's what it says. You have been set apart to the Lord today. And so the, the tribe of Levi now gets a special distinction from this day on where they're made the priestly tribe of the nation. And it's because of this, because they were willing to stand when God, when nobody else would. Hard lesson about God's wrath. So think about what's happened. The party's over now. And all the defiance is gone. The camp is settled down. But Moses has broken the tablets. He's, he's crushed the idol, made him drink it. He's publicly rebuked Aaron. And then he's weeded out the few that defied God right to the bitter end, which is kind of amazing when the swords came out and the first guy got run through. You would think the other ones would wake up and say, oh, well, maybe, that, maybe I should fly right here. But they didn't. 3,000 died. And now it's the next day. This is the aftermath. And notice what it's like. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. And it was, this is a huge sin. Please, please don't think this is a, a non-issue like Aaron. You have committed a great sin, but now I will go to the Lord. So I'm going back up the mountain. I will go to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So what does that mean? It means they're in the same predicament I was that day at the fair. Meaning God, God is still angry. Just because he decided not to wipe them out doesn't mean their sin's forgiven. In fact, they're not. Moses realizes their sin is still not forgiven. That God is on simmer. That God is angry. And there's consequences still that are hanging over their heads that haven't been dealt with yet. They're in a terrible spot. And so he's thinking, guys, you, you really blew it yesterday and I need to go up at the top of the mountain and I got to see if I can get some atonement for your sin. And atonement means covering. It's, it's, it's when they would sacrifice an animal, collect the blood and sprinkle it on the altar to cover, to cover the altar, to cover their sin. It means forgiveness. He's saying, I, I, I've got to go see if I can find a way for you guys to be forgiven because you're not you're not forgiven. You're not okay. You may be alive, but that doesn't mean everything's fine. You're still at odds with God. And so Moses goes up the mountain, verse 31. So Moses went back up to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. Verse 32, though, Moses, I, I tell you, he's a great, great man. But now please forgive their sin. Forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. There's a, there's a theme throughout the Bible about this book of life. And, and the idea of the book of life is your name was written in it. Everybody's, everybody, everybody's name gets written in the book of life because you, you had life. You existed. But the idea is names are blotted out when they're judged. And the only names that remain in the book of life are the ones that have eternal life in the end, the ones that get to heaven. And so Moses is saying, hey, if you won't forgive them, punish me instead. Hey, please forgive their sins. But if not, blot my name out of the book of life. Send me to hell. Let, let, let me bear the consequences. Let me be punished in their in their place, in a sense. I think Moses is so familiar with the sacrifices by now that he's thinking, maybe I can be the sacrifice. Maybe, maybe I can stand in the gap for them and maybe I can take the punishment of God so that they can be forgiven. Now, isn't that amazing? That is a great leader who loves his people is basically saying, hey, punish me instead. Let, let your wrath be upon me. 
That's an incredible offer when you think about it. I tell you, he was, he was a great man. But, but notice what it says in verse 33. But the Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. What is he saying? Well, this is scary stuff, sobering stuff about God's nature. Whoever has sinned against me, they're the names that get blotted out of my book. Think about what that means. Because we know the Bible says, for instance, that all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, he says, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. That's all of us. That's all of humanity. And, and what he's saying in a sense to Moses is you're not good enough to be the sacrifice for these people. Because you've sinned, Moses. Isn't Moses a murderer himself? Isn't it Remember the story all the way back in Egypt where he killed the Egyptian to guard a, a fellow Jew? Moses has his faults too. Now, I've said over and over intentionally that he's a great man. But hear me. But he's not a good man. There's a big difference between being good and being great because good is a moral statement. As Jesus in the Bible says, hey, there's no one good, no, not one. Because moral goodness, none of us meet that standard. It's again, we all have sinned and are worthy to be blotted out of the book. We all have sinned. And so Moses had sinned. And Moses is not a worthy Worthy sacrifice because the sacrifices had to be without blemish or spot. And Moses has his blemishes and spot. He's a great man, but he's not a good man. Good in the sense of only God is good, as Jesus put it. So we got a problem here. He's basically saying, Moses, you, you, can't, you can't die for their sins. You, you're not a good enough sacrifice. You're, you're already, with your sins, you're, you're worthy of being blotted out of the book. And this is a problem for every single one of us, every single human being on the planet. So verse 34. So now go, and we're going to find out God's still angry here. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. We're going to find out later what God, God means in this. But basically, he's saying this, I'm not going with you anymore. My angel's going to go with you instead, but I'm not going. I, I, I'm not hanging out with you. I'm not pitching my tent in the middle of your camp. I will not live with you. I will not live with a rebellious, sinful people. I am not going with you. You lead these people and I'll send an angel, but I'm not going is what he's saying, which is huge, heavy news. We'll find out later next week. However, when the time comes, and this is a big however, However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. That's heavy stuff. And that's the predicament of everyone in humanity, every single one of us. Because everyone who sins, worthy of being blotted out of the book. And even though we're alive, just as they are in the camp, even though we're alive doesn't mean we're good with God. In fact, they're not good with God. And so they have this punishment hanging over their heads, do they not? These consequences are looming for them. And they're living under this weight, this, this doom, this cloud, this storm that's coming. When the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sins. That is just ominous and heavy and hard. But that's the predicament of every single one of us. So if you go to Romans chapter 6, there's a verse in there. It's Romans 6, 23. It says this, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, we already saw that we all sin. There's no one good. No, not one. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. We've all violated the command. Remember, it's a plate glass window. And if you break it at one place, you break the whole window. The whole window has to be replaced. And so we know that Left to our own devices, we're in the same boat as the Jews. We're, we have this doom hanging over us. Death is looming. And God's judgment is there, in a sense, waiting for us. And that's the weight that every human being lives with in life, apart from Christ. 
And that's the picture here. In fact, it gets, it gets really bad in the next verse because verse 35, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. So a plague now lets loose in the camp and people start to die. And that's where, it, that's where the chapter ends. What are we to do? What are they to do? They're in a horrible place. But every human being's in the same place because we all sin. We all desire things that are not ours. We all tell things that aren't true. We all lust after the opposite sex. We all do these violations of the covenant. We all do them. And so what is our hope? Well, it's Jesus Christ. Moses couldn't die for their sins because he was a blemished sacrifice. He, 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 he wasn't the spotless lamb he needed to be. But that's why God had to come in the flesh. Ask yourself this question. How was Moses saved? He saved the same reason we're saved. Except he was looking forward to Jesus and we look backward to Jesus. But it's still Jesus, that sacrifice for the sins of the world. So Jesus had to come. Why? Because no one's good except for God. So God had to come in the flesh, live amongst us, and perfectly live out the covenant to fulfill it, to, to complete the law, as he said. He came and lived this perfect life on earth. But then he willingly went to the cross to die in our place. To be that lamb that was sacrificed so the blood could atone for our sins. And when Jesus died that day on the cross, when he gave up his spirit, he says, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit and died. When that happened, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom and access to God was given back again. And all who ever believed, whether they were looking forward to Christ or us looking back to Christ, whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this camp of 2 million people, they don't know this yet. And this process with the golden calf, God's going to teach them about sin, the enormity of sin, and the, the seriousness of how do you ever pay for it? How do you ever get rid of the consequences? How do you cover sin? And there's only way under, one way under heaven by which we may be saved, and it's Jesus Christ. And so wherever you are, if, if you're one of these people that, that you haven't really actually embraced Jesus as your Savior yet, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. And so until we receive Jesus Christ, until we receive into our hearts and into our lives, we live under this foreboding doom, this thing that we all face and it's called death. And it's not just physical death. It's eternal separation from God. And so if you're in that place where you haven't received Christ yet, receive Christ. But if you're one of those who have already received Christ, you have something to celebrate today because all your sins have been washed away. All, 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 all the things you've ever done, whether before or after, are forgiven in Christ. And you have eternal life in him. And God has adopted you into his family. And you're now one of his most loved children in, in all the world, right? He, he loves you and he's with you. And he, he, he has this life for you. And it's all because of what Jesus has done. And so this table for you is this remembrance of him and this incre incredible gratitude. And wow, you saved me from myself. You saved me from my sins and you set me free to give me life. Praise God. And that is who's worthy of the praise. And so I want to pray and I want to do Lord's Supper together this morning as we finish out. But let's pray first. Let's pray first. Lord, we do praise you this morning. For, 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 for your 
honesty, your willingness to give us this stark picture of reality, this unwelcomed, offensive thing that tells us we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. You warn us, you tell us. Thank you for being honest and giving us this real picture of where we stand with you apart from Christ. And Lord, for those who are here today who don't know you yet, Lord, lay on their hearts this incredible passion for, for being free, for being forgiven and, and having this relationship with God and help them to receive Christ, to, to admit that they are sinners and they need help and they can't save themselves and they need you and help them to ask you into their hearts right now and be saved. And Lord, for those who are saved, who've already in Christ, Lord, oh, oh, help us to be so incredibly thankful. Help us to have this joy and this excitement in life because, because all of that weight and all of that sin and all of that punishment, that future punishment is gone. And the consequences have been erased and, and we get to have life in you. We, we get to have heaven. We get to have peace and we get to enjoy your love. We get to enjoy grace, that amazing grace. Praise you, Lord. And as we come to the table today, Lord, we just want to thank you for all you've done for us, for being willing to come and die in our place so that we might live. So our name might not be blotted out of your book and we might live. Thank you for helping us escape the consequences and punishment that we were so rightly due and giving us life and liberty and love instead. We praise you. And in Jesus' name, we say amen.